we've been talking about horses so much the past few weeks. And in order to show my commitment to being a true Montanan, I decided to go for a ride on a horse this week. It was my first time on a horse in really a decade, but soon this horse began to bounce out of control and he started to get faster and faster. And I, I pulled back on those reins to try and slow him down, but it didn't work. And in an effort to stop the horse, my foot got kind of tripped up in the stirrup and I was actually thrown off to the side. I thought I was going to be dragged to death when the manager of Walmart came over and unplugged the horse from the wall. See, my commitment to the vision of being a true Montana and knows no bounds. But really, doesn't this sum up our commitment at times to the gospel? Jesus calls us towards something more faithful or actionable in our word world, and how many of us are 80% committed or 40% committed? What role does faith have in your life? Are you allowing Jesus to call you away from something? Does God play a role in your life or are you just connecting on Sunday morning? Are you just looking for a little something to get through your week and actually not looking to put anything back? See, I wonder if we as Christians have gotten a little lazy because over the past couple of decades, we've kind of shifted our faith to be much more introspective and individual than communal and changing the world. When we talk about commitment, I cannot help but think of 20th century theologian and Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood against the Third Reich in Germany, giving everything, giving his life, for his faith. Would there be anything in our city or our state or our country or our world that you would be willing to give up? Or are we just going to get on the kitty horse at Walmart and call that good enough? Well, Luke, who is the writer of both this gospel and the book of Acts, is most likely writing to his good friend, the officers, to tell him the story of Jesus and this group of followers who are trying to make the world a better place. It's out of their own faith that they have sacrificed everything so that something new might come about. It is out of our own faith we too are asked, what will we sacrifice? I don't think we can say that we will sacrifice much without a little reward, but we are here today. We are bearers of the act of sacrifice of those first disciples. In chapter 14, Luke pairs together these two stories of Jesus, these two long stories of Jesus and a really interesting perspective on how we should be as Christians. Now, to separate these texts means to not understand how Luke, and I dare say Christ, calls us to be in the world. The first story is about having a party. Jesus was invited to this formal dinner. Let's say it's at, you know, the bishop's house and all the respectable rabbis and clergy and politicians are there. And they're having this dialogue about who's going to sit where when Jesus says, I have an idea. When you have a dinner, instead of inviting the wealthy and the powerful, why don't you invite the poor, and the lame, and the blind? Why don't you invite those who can't repay you? Well, you can imagine the grumbling that they began at this. I'm powerful, though. I'm, I'm wealthy. I'm an important person. And so Jesus invites us to build friendships and relationships with those who aren't powerful who aren't wealthy, who are deemed marginalized, who are ignored by society. I want to be absolutely clear. This concept of inclusion and justice is not new to Christianity. You're going to hear people in the world today from a certain Christian framework claim that social justice is new and political and not Jesus. Well, I read social justice here. I read Jesus challenging us to change our viewpoint and our perspective and our understanding of others in our social world. And I see Christian people doing that 
throughout history. In 1746, John Wesley formed the very first free medical clinic in England. Can you imagine the response? One quote said he should stick to his evangelical fervor and leave medicine to the professionals. Not that Wesley didn't hire doctors for his clinic, but he was called to help the suffering. And that came from these stories of Jesus. So Jesus cares about how we live our lives. Jesus cares about the way we engage with everyone in society. Here's a story about an old cowboy who one Sunday morning entered a church just before services were to begin. And although the man was old and his clothes were spotlessly clean, he wore jeans and he had a denim shirt on. He had boots that were pretty worn and ragged. In his hat, hand, he had his hat, which was equally as worn. And he carried a really, really worn Bible. The church he entered was in a pretty upscale, exclusive part of the city. It was the largest, biggest, most beautiful church on the block. And the people of the congregation were all dressed in their expensive clothes. And as the cowboy took his seat, others happened to move away from him. No one greeted him or spoke to him or welcomed him. The preacher gave a long fire sermon about hellfire and brimstone and a lecture on how much money the church needed to do God's work. And as the old cowboy was turning to leave, the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy to do him a favor. Before you come back here again, have a talk with God. Ask him what he thinks would be appropriate attire for worship. The old cowboy assured the preacher he would. And the next Sunday, he showed up for the service wearing the same ragged jeans, shirt, boots, and hat. Once again, he was shunned and ignored. The preacher approached the man and said, I thought I asked you to speak to God before you came back to our church. I did, replied the old cowboy. Well, if you spoke to God, what did he tell you the proper attire should be for worshiping here? Well, sir, the good cowboy said, God told me that he didn't have a clue what I wish to wear. He says he's never been in this church. When we say we are the church, we need to live fully into what that means. We need to welcome the vulnerable and the suffering. We need to welcome people who are marginalized. We need to welcome people who are different than us. Is that who we say we are? Is that who we strive to be? The second story in this chapter of Luke is much more challenging than the first. Because Jesus says, now you have to hate your mother and your brother and your spouse and your children and your siblings and all your possessions. How can Jesus tell me to radically love my neighbor and not my family? I mean, Jesus even said, I have to love my enemies. And now he's saying, I have to hate my family. What is going on here? Jesus is not saying to hate your family as much as some of you might want him to say that every now and again. He is saying that to be his disciples, you may have to give up loyalty to something else, country, tribe, family. If you want to be a disciple, you may have to choose a different life. That is going to be challenging and include costs. Jesus is even clear that our possessions can possess us and take us away from being a disciple. Shiny new objects are distractions from living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is clear. Being devoted to God means prioritizing care for the least of these. These are the two primary functions of discipleship. Along the way, you are going to have to make a choice. Now, here's where things get really hard when you have to make the choice. If your discipleship is going to make people within your family of origin uncomfortable, people in your social circles uncomfortable, people in your life uncomfortable, then you are going to be putting your loyalty to them above the call to follow Jesus. If the state, the government, the, the church leadership are abusing their power and you are willing to hold them accountable, then you are choosing state over God. If our police are not called to justice, to be accountable to us as a citizenry, and we are allowing our disobedience, we're allowing our obedience to earthly powers 
supersede our obedience to God. If we recognize injustice and we sit silently by, then we are the ones standing, not with God. So hear me say this. We all, every single one of us, fail at following Jesus. There is no way to deliver that line subtly or gently. We fail. I have too much stuff. I have too many distractions. I'm always going to choose my kids and my spouse above most everything else. Jesus calls us to recognize that and to struggle with it and to work to embrace discipleship differently. Jesus isn't saying you got to be perfect, perfect every time. You know, honestly, we should all be living in communal housing. We should be pooling our money together so it goes to help those who are suffering the most. We shouldn't care what job we have as long as it's doing something that makes the world better. We shouldn't worry about our retirements. You can stop putting money in your pensions. It's fine. We really should be focused on inviting as many people to the Jesus party as we can. I mean, who's with me? Who's ready to sell their house, live in the church, and be a radical disciple of Jesus Christ? I want to go back to the story in the gospel of Luke when Jesus says discipleship has a cost and they knew it already. Those disciples had felt that cost. And if you don't understand what you are committed to, then you can't know what it's going to cost. Jesus is inviting us to know what our commitment is and to live fully into that vision. I can't help but think of it like the very end of the story of Lonesome Dove. You know, that miniseries that came out 20 years ago about two Texas Rangers who took horses to this beautiful valley we call Bozeman. It's really the tale of Nelson's story, but at the end, after bringing his friend back to Texas to be buried, Captain Call is asked if the commitment was worth it. They, they say you carried your friend 3,000 miles just to bury him. Is that true? They say that both of you were Texas Rangers back in the old days, that you cleaned the Comanches out and the bandits. Is that true? They say you started the first cattle ranch up in Montana. They say you're a man of vision. vision for God's kingdom. Keep this inclusive, hopeful, just place before you, and you will remain committed to what God calls us to do. This is the way of commitment. Amen.